Good morning, everybody. If I could uh, encourage you to take your seats for the next session. Hi, I'm Ramesh Vaitalingam. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Economics Observatory, and I'm just going to introduce the um, uh, host for the next session, who is the uh, Director of the Economics Observatory. And the title for this session is The Ongoing Toll, uh, and we're going to be talking about mental health, well-being, resilience, aspects of the pandemic and beyond. So let me uh, welcome Richard to the stage and his team. Richard Davis. Everyone. Yeah, from here. <laughs> I'll, I'll be I was told yesterday these things are called Madonna mics, but apparently they're also called Whitney mics. That just shows how old I am. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Richard. It's a generation <laughs> thing. It's great to see everyone here, um, and I'd like to welcome uh, my panel here, all experts, true experts, with a very different kind of perspective on this massively important issue. So to my immediate left, we have Dominique Thompson. Hello. She uh, was a GP, and she's now an author, uh, and has written a fantastic book about uh, bringing up young people. Uh, and she can give us her perspective from, you know, on the ground, real life experience of mental health. She al was also, everybody here, I think, apart from uh, Stuart at the end, has a really strong Bristol connection. She was the, the GP for Bristol University for some time. To her left, we have Professor Dame Carol Proper, uh, who's at <laughs> Imperial and for a long time was at Bristol. Um, to Carol's left, we have Fabian post Velvenet. He's a professor at UCL and also, for a long time, was at Bristol. And at the end of the line, boom, <laughs> we have yeah. Stuart, who's from Glasgow. Uh, he teaches at Strathclyde, uh, and he's the final member of our panel. So I'm going to open up and ask people to briefly, and I will hold you to this, so I want sort of two, three minutes, just give me your really number one top observation mm. of what we've been seeing uh, based on your experience of this nexus between the crisis we've been through mm. and, and mental health. Okay, thank you, Richard. So um, just to say, so I was a GP at Bristol University for nearly 20 years, head of uh, student health there for quite a few years. And in that time, in those sort of 20 years, I saw a significant rise in the number of young people coming to see the GPs um, with a mental health problem. And, you know, when I started, it might be one or two young people a day out of 30 or 40. And by the time um, I left the practice to set up my own business about four years ago, it was nine out of 10 of all of my GPs. GP consultations. Now, I completely accept that some of that was because I was a GP with special interest in mental health. Um, I developed that interest because of the demand. But on average in the UK, university GPs were seeing one in two of their consultations for mental health. That was before the pandemic. We have now added in an enormous amount of anxiety and isolation. All of the impacts that we've seen, including people developing post-traumatic stress disorder, new tics, which is a new phenomenon that we're seeing a lot more of, um, and obviously all sorts of issues around obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, things like that. Those have all gone up hugely, um, as well as, and it, it has to be mentioned, eating disorders and self-harm um, have rocketed over the last 18 months. Things were not okay before COVID, and they are now worse. So what I guess, I would summarize it as is that with COVID, um, we've seen the impact perhaps most in the physical sense on the older population, but the mental impact is going to have been on the younger population to the extent that GPs are seeing almost regularly now, which was almost unheard of before, seven-year-olds with anxiety or eating disorders. Wow. So we just need to be aware that we need to think about that next generation and the impact that it's had. Okay. I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Carol. Um, I want to talk about this from a, a, an academic perspective, and I'm a specialist in healthcare as well as health issues. And so the first thing that when we think about the ongoing toll is clearly there's an ongoing toll on the NHS. All the people that came in for COVID crowded out other people from being treated, and people stayed away from their GPs and the hospitals because of fear of COVID. So there's a, we all know about the huge backlog in waiting lists, including particularly waiting lists around CAMS, uh, child and adolescent mental health. But what I also want to talk about is that, as we heard yesterday, this is an economic and health impact. 
and the health crisis has caused an economic recession. And economic recessions themselves cause health problems. So when we looked at, I did some work where we looked at the 2010 financial crisis, and what we found is the economic recession of 2010 had an ongoing impact on people's health. It had an ongoing impact on their chronic health and on their mental health as well. So chronic physical health, things like COPD, chronic uh, obstetric, well, essentially uh, lung functioning, had a problem with their cardiac functioning, but it also had a problem on mon mental health. And the final thing I want to say in this kind of opening thing is that, that the impact of the recession was not th on health was not the same in all places. Places that already had people in poor mental health, in poor physical health, and who were economically deprived had a larger re negative response to the recession in terms of their health than people who lived in more affluent areas. Okay, that's really interesting. So in some sense, we went into this with a very um, uneven field in terms of resilience, the, the resilience we went into it with. Um, Fabian, over to you. Thank you. So uh, I the, the I'd like to zoom in uh, uh, on, on a particular aspect of this, uh, you know, a particular impact of this pandemic, which is the impact it has had on labor markets. Uh, even though this is a, a panel about mental health, I, I, I guess I'm a labor economist at heart, so let me make approach this from a labor economist perspective, uh, starting by saying that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, induced recession for a, to a labor economist is a, is a shock to the labor market of unprecedented magnitude. It's caused a lot of income loss, a lot of job loss, and a lot of job reallocation, and also a lot of uh, transformation in terms of the contents of um, of um, you know different jobs and different occupations, all of that has uh, mental health consequences. And indeed, if uh, you know thinking about the relationship between the you know labor market experiences of people and their mental health, well, we know that it's a relationship that goes in in both directions. We know uh, very well that uh, you know people who suffer from mental health problems are less likely to be in work, and when they are in work, they're less they're more likely to underperform and go on sick leave. And you know, uh, quit their jobs, etc. And conversely, uh, we also know that uh, people who experience adverse labor market shocks, and that can be losing one's job, but that can also be, uh, you know, being displaced into a job for which one is not well matched. Um, uh, you know, I think Richard in the previous panel talked about bad jobs. Uh, there are lots of those around these days. Uh, I mean, that has uh, uh, consequences on on um, on um, you know, the workers' mental health. And so, uh, you know, the, like I said, the COVID-19 pandemic was, a, a, you know, a, a labor market reallocation shock of unprecedented magnitude. It was also at the same time, uh, you know, had a direct impact on people's mental health for uh, reasons that were discussed by the <laughs> previous two panelists. Um, and, and that, you know, makes for, you know, a, 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 a very, very toxic mixture indeed. Um, just to, uh, conclude this th introduction in, in terms of uh, you know a few remarks about the way to think about policy. Uh, the policy response to uh, to in particular the labor market policy response. Well, Fabian, let me yeah. pause you on yeah. policy because I yeah. really want to dig into policy in, okay. in a major way. So let's <laughs> let, let me let me move on t uh, to Stuart, um, who comes from a part of the world and a city in particular that has a really interesting and troubled history, really, between the relationship between the economy and health broadly defined, including mental health. I hope we can get into that. But your, your big picture, your top point, Stuart, on what's happened over the past two years in this, in this nexus between the economy and mental health. Well, I think it's really interesting. I mean, Fabian just mm. talked there about the micro impact. So let me focus on the macro, Im macro impacts because I've spent a good amount of time through the pandemic trying to forecast what's happening in, in the UK and, and particularly regional economies of the UK. Um, and Carol mentioned the global financial crisis. And one of the things that I was reflecting on as I was preparing for today was if you wind the clock back to the global financial crisis period, everyone thought, well, the economy will just bounce back. It will just, you know, we'll sort the problem with the banks and actually it will just bounce back. 
And there's, there was a brilliant chart, I hope no one from the OBR is here tonight, we slightly rude about it, but, um, and it's referred to as the porcupine chart. And it's essentially, we are going to return back to trend productivity, which is bounce back. And they kept forecasting that this would happen and this would happen. And the effect of this was the chart started to look like a porcupine. Um, and of course it didn't happen. And it didn't happen because there was a big structural change in the economy. And I think when we reflect back on the pandemic, and Carol mentioned, economic crisis have health crisis. This economic crisis was caused by a health crisis and the impacts of it are going to endure. And so one of the things that I'm quite nervous about is the sense that, well, things are reopening now. The economy is going to bounce back, everything will be fine. I don't think we've begun to understand the ways in which the pandemic has affected our health and mental health, the way that interacts with our ability to work our ability to study, our ability to accumulate skills and qualifications. Um, and so for me, there's a very long road ahead and we're only beginning now to understand what that might look like. And I guess if I had a top line I was leaving you with, I think we tend to view economic crisis as being an economic policy problem and health crisis as being a social policy problem. Without a doubt, the health and mental health crisis that we have as we emerge from the pandemic needs to be viewed as an economic policy problem. And part of that is simply that when you talk about an economic policy problem or talk about something as an economic problem, a wider constituency of people will listen. Rightly or wrongly. Yeah. And um, thank you for those, those intros. Really, really helpful. I definitely want us to get to policy. Um, I definitely also want us to get into a really um, uh, deep discussion of, of where we are right now. But perhaps we could start by now zooming back a little bit. And I'm going to come back to, to Carol uh, and to Dominique and ask you, I think you first, uh, Carol, and then Dominique, for your reflections on how and why we got to this point. You, m you Carol, mentioned this uneven playing field or this these pockets of lacking resilience. And Dominic, you talked about this a long-term trend. How and why did those those things arise? I mean, if we're talking about, I think, how we didn't really understand the link between health, including physical and mental health, and economics, it was partly, I think, because although epidemiologists and public policy uh, scholars in health are very concerned about inequalities, there wasn't the kind of joined up thought that Stuart's talking about in terms of macroeconomics, of understanding that economic shocks to the economy cause health shocks and that those health shocks can be very long lasting. Again, work that colleagues and I have done have shown that if you have an economic shock in an area, it takes two to three years for that to show up fully as a health shock. That then has a knock-on effect for the need for health care that isn't really taken into account in the kind of um, allocation formulae that we use in Britain. Those allocation formulae are, are based on need and on population, but they're often not updated very rapidly because it's a very political thing who you give money to. So they don't want to update them too much in case you update them and lose a marginal seat. <laughs> This is not good <laughs> in politics. So I think that it hasn't really been recognized that there is this nexus between macroeconomic shocks and micro health. Mm. Um, and the NHS is always kind of running to pick that up. And the other thing I want to say in terms of how we got to where we are is that we think about health being dealt with by spending on health care. But that's wrong. Health is produced by all sorts of things, of which I don't want to be rude to Dominique, but healthcare is only a very small part of that. Mm. And that we don't think enough about economic shocks affecting people's education and that affecting their health um, and their ability to work. So it's those joined up nexuses, which I think actually COVID has shown us, mm. uh, which is quite helpful in terms of advancing ways of dealing with things. 
Dominic, one of the things that we um, uh, teach our students when they're writing about economics here at Bristol is you need to grab people's attention. And one of the things is an important subject that can be too dry. And one of the things we teach them is, you, if you can, tell a story about a person. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure you, of course, there's patient confidentiality. <laughs> but I wondered if, before, we, before actually you talk about this trend, could you just give the audience a flavour if you want, of the kind of median, a, a typical case, the typical cases you're, uh, you were seeing, the types of things people were facing and how it was affecting their lives. Before the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. How would people present to you? What's the real life story that you faced as a GP? Oh, I mean, um, there are, uh, well, of course, there are so many. I mean, um, just, just to give you some context, I was telling Richard earlier, I've done a TEDx talk called What I Learned from 78,000 Consultations with University Students, just to give you a sense. So I have seen a lot a good of data students. <laughs> that's, that's a very good data But um, there are some that do um, particularly stick out in my mind, um, and they are often the story where someone has come in and they feel absolutely at rock bottom. They've come, it's kind of a last resort when they sit in the chair in front of you and they say, I don't know where else to go. I don't even know if you can help me. Those ones tend to, you know, stick in your mind and um, they, they often have been struggling for a long time. And it's very common for people to wait a long time before seeking help. Um, they might be afraid of what you're going to say. I and mean, there are lots of very reasonable reasons why they do that. But, um, you know, it, it means that they've gone quite far down that, that path. And then when we do start to talk, um, you know, there can be a real reluctance for the person sitting in front of you to tell other people. There's still a significant amount of stigma. I mean, they might have very supportive friends and family, but they just won't feel comfortable telling them because mm. they're worried that they're going to let them down or they'll feel judged in some way. So some of my work was just trying to help people to talk to their closest, nearest and dearest about what was bothering them. And then I would see people um, with, you know, their, their entire world became sort of focused, whether it was around food or around, you know, washing their hands. I had a student who took six hours every day in the bathroom, so he, he couldn't leave the house, effectively, it became, to go to lectures. Because he was washing his because hands. Because he was washing his hands um, so much. Mm -hmm. um, and, and another young man who... Um, his routine, I've written about this one uh, in my little series of books for students about well-being because it's such a striking case of obsessive compulsive disorder, but basically he had a routine that meant if the goodbyes weren't said correctly as people left the house, his student house in the morning, then he couldn't leave. So if the routine wasn't followed, he would sit on the stair until they came home and he wouldn't move from there. He wouldn't eat, drink, go to the toilet or anything else till they came home and did the goodbye routine properly. Mm. And they didn't know. So, you know, there are some really difficult things that young people are living with. Um, and all of that on top of trying to get a degree um, you know, have relationships with your friends yeah. and flatmates and all of the other stuff that's going on in your life. And so, again, I'm sure in 78,000 cases, you're going to have a huge variety. Mm. But if you could mention a, a couple of the strongest themes that you're seeing, mm. either for those patients or for others, of what was sort of one step back, what was the cause of that? Yeah. And if you can... Do you have an explanation of why was that cause increasing over time before the pandemic? Yeah, it's a really complex um, <laughs> situation. And as we all know, there's no one single answer to why are we seeing more mental health problems in young people. If there was one single answer, we would be doing it already. But what I can do is tell you a couple of key themes. And I'm sure if you're interested, you'll be able to go and, and read a bit more about things. Um, <coughs> so... One of the things that there's been the biggest shift in over the last 20 or so years is that uh, life for uh, young people now, Gen Z, if you like, the 11 to 25 year olds, is much more competitive um, than it was in the past. So we've got a world that we live in where it's not just your academic stuff and your sports stuff that is competitive, but we've made cooking competitive, we've made cake competitive, we've made falling in love on an island competitive. <laughs> it's quite a lot of pressure for young people. Um, it means you have to succeed, you have to be the best at everything. That's the messaging, I'm not saying that, that's mm. the messaging. So what we now know from some studies coming from the States, for example, I uh, and in the UK, is that the biggest fear for the younger generation is not bullying or family breakup, it's fear of failure. 
So this, this feeling of being terrified, of getting stuff wrong, of making mistakes, of letting down the people that you care about, those are the key themes that are coming through. And that is why often young people won't talk to their families, even if they've got a really supportive family. And a family sitting at home thinking, well, we'll be all right because they'll talk to us because mm. we've got a good relationship. They won't. Mm -hmm. I know that because they sit in front of me and say, I'm not telling them. I don't want to let them down. I don't want to worry them. And my message always to young people is it's fine. I'm a mum. I know what it feels like at the other side. We want to know. We're there to help you. But, I you know, it is hard to, to breach that and, and kind of get people to cross that bridge and, and tell about what they view as a failure, even though it isn't a failure. It's all part of life. So I can talk about this stuff all day, and I'm aware that there are three other people uh, here, so I will stop, but I'm happy to answer it's questions. It's really important for us and for the audience to have the kind of real-life story, and the, and the thing that, that I take from it, um, being not an expert, is just the scale of the problem, mm -hmm. and then that also whatever that measured scale must be is going to be an underestimate, because clearly um, the cases you're describing are ones of people that are shouldering this burden alone often and not talking about it and we when we measure things as economists we can only measure it when people mm -hmm. answer a survey or say they've got a problem so we're going to be underestimating yeah. this thing i wonder if i could turn um now to you fabian and talk a little bit about the labor market and particularly um, if you could explain to the audience some of your research where you've looked really interestingly at differing types of jobs and the kind of different levels of stress that people receive in those jobs and how that the interplay with that uh, and mental health. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll actually start uh, by echoing something that Dominique just said, uh, uh, you know, about the, uh, the world becoming more competitive for, for young people. Uh, we observe something similar in, in the wider labor market. Uh, when we look at measures of, uh, let's say, the stress content, for example, of, of particular occupations versus the uh, physical hazard content uh, of occupations. We observe that over uh, the kind of medium to long term, we're talking three to four decades, the uh, amount of time for which we have data, uh, the distribution of, of, of jobs has shifted towards jobs that are less physically hazardous and less strenuous and more psychologically pressurizing and less fulfilling and, and you know, more stress loaded. So can, can, can you give an example of that? So I guess um, uh, in, in days gone by, and people, well, it, people would have worked, you know, we're near Wales, would have worked in mining. Yes. Ultra dangerous job. Yes. Um, na and that was, that's what you talk about by physical danger. What are the mental dangers? Is it sort of fear of, what are they? So well, there, there, there are different measures. Yeah. Uh, you know, some are, uh, you know, some, something that is measured as tolerance to stress, for example. Okay. But others are uh, responses to questions about, you know, is, is the job dull and repetitive? Is it fulfilling? Is it, you know, things that are, uh, you know, uh, uh, attributes of the job that, are, that usually correlate negatively with okay. mental health um, outcomes. Uh, it's interesting what you were saying about mining and, uh, you know, the, uh, it's, uh, this evolution that I was talking about towards less physically hazardous jobs and more and, and more uh, uh, stressful jobs is partly driven by what you were describing, so a shift in sort of the distribution of occupations. There are less, you know, people working in mining now and, and, more, uh, and more people working in, in desk jobs. But most of it, most of that evolution towards more stress is driven by an increase in stress within occupations. So, so it's just, you know, being an accountant or whatever it has become more stressful over time, according to those to those measures. And uh, sort of going back just very briefly to, to yeah. COVID. Uh, so, if you look at the uh, the, the distribution the, of labor demand now, as we see it, uh, uh, you know, you see in the headlines that uh, the vacancies are you know at a historic high and that everything's looking good, much better than people had predicted on the labor market. Well, that's partly true, but it's, it's, it's just a very aggregate figure. If you look at the distribution of occupations, the labor market looks like you know, a, a somewhat different place to what it was before the pandemic, in particular in terms of the distribution of those job attributes that are potentially impactful on, on people's health in general, but mental health in particular. I'll just emphasize one job attribute which was you know, completely overlooked before the pandemic, but which has now become very, very important, and that's uh, 
a measure of the proximity to others in the workplace, for example, mm. or things like you know various measures of exposures to the virus. You know, nobody would have thought anything of, of, of you know uh, paid, paid attention to, to uh, you know how, how close you would be to your coworkers before the pandemic. Now it's it's become something that that people you know have, have pay a lot of attention to and become very very nervous about. Mm. And so we have to kind of think of uh, uh, you know policies to to and I know we're going to talk about policy later yeah. but we're going to keep that in mind where where we No for sure we'll, we'll come to policy but on so on on the workplace um and I'll bounce this one to ask to you um, Frederick, but also bounce it back to you um Dominique um what I thought you were going to say um when you mentioned the workplace there in your in your conclusion was that the workplace has changed so that we see each other a lot less now, I, I'm, I uh, uh, write about economics, but mainly about macroeconomics. I'm not particularly um, tuned in with um, mental health, but I do know that one of the, the main things, one of the treatments, essentially, is often talking therapies. And to what extent does the fact of when we go to work and have chats around the, uh, the metaphorical water cooler <laughs> and are just able to vent to our colleagues or our cohort when we're students... Does does the proximity the proximity is now a risk for us because of COVID? Was it previously though also a benefit to us because we got to talk about our problems a bit more and, and, and share things? Oh yeah, humans need other humans. It's fundamental for survival. When we all lived in caves, you know, millennia ago. Don't ask me how many. I'm not very good at the geography. <laughs> but basically, sometime pre Zoom. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. basically <laughs> a long time ago. You know, if if someone did something wrong in that tribe, they were banished to the wilderness because they were going to live on their own. They didn't have the safety of the tribe. We've evolved to need other people. Um, and now, whilst we all like a bit of space and I've got to have my me time, um, actually, we still need other people. And face to face is literally, you know, face to face is better than, you know, Zoom or uh, even if you can see somebody on the screen. Yeah. Um, so there is no doubt that fundamentally for mental health, we need other people around us. OK, that's really interesting. And so one thing I guess we should worry about, I'm going to come come to you now, um, Stuart, to talk about how long this is going to echo and, and, wha and what we can say about that. But one thing, one thing we have to add, I guess, to our previous experience of things like the financial crash, which maybe you could describe, we need to add the fact that when people are going back to work, they may be going back to a more individualistic, atomistic, we're all talking to people, uh, each other on Zoom kind of work. So... That's another reason it might linger for longer. But but what do we know, Stuart, about how long these things last for? And, and why is your warning that we kind of shouldn't expect things to snap back too quickly? Uh, there's a few things in there, and I'll try not to talk for too long, um, as we've all committed to, to doing. Um, I think there's a few things in here. I think we're only now beginning to understand who's affected and how. We've got big backlogs in the NHS. We've got chronic underfunding of, of mental health services it's a moving target and then in that sense because it depends on what the reaction of government is you know does government come forward and and, and start funding all this um, at a much greater level so it might snap back a bit quicker um, but as a general point we know that um, and we talked that the panel before this was, was emphasized the scarring effects that economic crises have on individuals and the way in which this can set back individual life experiences by years and years. Um, people who are out of the labour market for a while or are later to accumulate skills and experience than otherwise would have been. Um, but I think as well, when we think about what are we snapping back to in terms of even the workplace, I mean, we did some work over the last year with CIPD, they produce a good work index. Um, I'd spent many hours on sitting crunching stata code to produce their output. Um, and one of the interesting things that emerged from that was the importance of relationships. But not just relationships with your peers, relationships with your managers. And I think one of the interesting things, when we do go back increasingly to working from a, in a more traditional way, is what happens to those relationships? Because those relationships have been stressed quite a lot over the last 18 months. Um, you know, managers have had to adjust how they're managing people. Um, colleagues have had to work out a new way of 
um, working with each other. New colleagues have joined and had to be embedded within an organization in a very different way than they would previously. So you, know, you start a new job and here's a box with a laptop and we'll see you in a Zoom call. Mm. Um, where we end up with this is completely, to, m to me right now, uncertain because there's so many moving parts. Um, and I think if we do step forward and deal with this more, some of the health, mental health consequences as an economic problem, in the same way that we've dealt with, or dealt with, we've made progress on um, uh, gender participation and flexible working and everything else, we're far from solved those problems, but we dealt with them as an economic problem. And we've made substantial progress over the last few decades. Mm. If we do the same with health and mental health, we may get back much more quickly to the levels of economic performance and prosperity that we had historically. Yeah. But if we don't, we could be looking at decades of. Yeah. And so, so, so on that, let's let's. Um, I want to turn to to policy and things that work and so on. But let's sketch out. Let's be complete in this discussion. Sort of sketch out the 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 more doom laden <laughs> case and there is you know as i mentioned you come from glasgow it's a hugely interesting city um it's a city where there is this phenomenon that some people in the audience will know about somewhere and it's called the glasgow effect <laughs> um i wonder if you could just sketch out briefly what that is and why we should be worried about the fact that a shock that happened potentially many decades ago could echo decades into the future yeah, I think this is a really interesting example as well of the way in which an economic crisis and essentially deindustrialization, and it wasn't just Glasgow and Scotland, there were pockets of all across the UK and indeed um, the, the Western world where this has happened. You look at geographies of, of the US and you see something similar. But essentially, if you look at health outcomes in Glasgow, now, one, one thing, and th this goes to something um, Carol talked about earlier about um, different outcomes in relatively closely related places. There's a subway in Glasgow, right? It has 14 stops. It, in our route, outer loop, 14 stops goes, takes you from the West End, University of Glasgow, um, through Govan, out to Cessna, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody has created a life expectancy version of that where they put at each stop the average life expectancy for men and for women. The gap between some of those stops is decades in average life expectancy within the same city. And that's partly a result of the way in which different parts of the city have evolved economically, um, but also the way in which decisions have been made about where to locate economic activity. And so if you look at health outcomes in Glasgow, and this is where the Glasgow effect comes in, and you look at comparable individuals in Manchester and in Birmingham um, and other cities that um, suffered de degrees of deindustrialization, there is still an unexplained negative impact of on health for people in Glasgow, the Glasgow effect. There is, you know, think about regression model, there's a Glasgow dummy in there, and it is significant and positive, positive depending on how you look at it, um, negative in terms of, of, of life expectancy. Um, and that's decades and decades ago. And it was the failure of policy to manage that process of deindustrialization. And it, it reminds me slightly of, um, it goes back to another point as well about competition. We're competing for everything. Competition has its benefits, but also has its costs. And one of the drivers of, of deindustrialization was that we were competing globally and we weren't able to compete on cost. Mm. And if we decided that was our approach, we were going to compete on cost, well, we were always gonna lose that fight. Mm. And rec we didn't recognize that policy um, and governments didn't recognize that, um, or if they did, they didn't do anything about it. And well the legacy of that is now- When this is, a this is a vital story, it's essentially a story about global trade, and we've got yeah. a global trade uh, session a little bit later, but I think what we can take, and I think the important thing for the for the audience to take away from this is, there are some pretty bad examples, yeah. of a, a, and to really simplify it, to be the journalist, which is my role here, is to say, you had a city that was the world leader in shipping, it lost shipping, 
and then decades and decades later are still suffer suffering from that. So we don't want there to be a kind of um, Glasgow effect, a kind of COVID cohort effect on this current generation of young people. Just before we turn to policy, and after policy, I'm going to come to the audience, so please do start uh, thinking of your questions. I'm sure there'll be lots, particularly from this area over here. <laughs> um, uh, I wondered if Those we could your students. No, it yeah. could be. I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, I wondered if we um, could have just a little snapshot f from people of where you think we are right now. And we'll go down the line again. So just uh, li literally a minute. Wh where you think, and particularly your your key worry about where we are right now, and then we'll discuss what we should do about it. So Dominique. Oh, there's so many issues, aren't there? I would say that I worry about the fact that the NHS is not coping right now. I don't think there will be a simple solution. I don't think we'll be able to do that this, uh, this morning. But um, I, I worry that things are not going well at the moment. So we're referring people and either it's just being turned away full stop or it, the wait is so long as to be unrealistic and unhelpful you know detrimental to health uh, I'm particularly talking about mental health services but actually you could say that about a lot of different things at the moment um, and I I don't know where we're going to go because because the staff in the NHS have taken such a hit you know over the last 18 months um, and there is this huge backlog and before, in terms of mental health, we had the people who were unwell and we knew they were unwell and we were trying to seek treatment. There were people teetering on the edge, mm. but who have teetered over the edge. And we've got people who never had a problem who now have a problem. So it isn't just catch up. That's what worries me. Okay. Carol. Um, mine is a rather, I completely echo what Dominique says, but I also have a rather broader quest sort of observation, which is came up in the session before which is I think that COVID has really exposed the inequalities that there are in our society. Inequalities in ability to earn, inequalities in quality of job, inequalities in health, inequalities in life expectancy, and inequalities in resources. And that when you're thinking about going forward, we're thinking about going forward from a very unequal place. Some people have been completely protected from the pandemic, except they haven't been able to see their friends but they've in fact become wealth, they've amassed wealth in that period. But an awful lot of people have lost income and have more unstable jobs and have poorer health and will go on to have poorer health. And I think inequality, there's quite a lot of epidemiological research which shows that inequality per se is associated with greater inequality in health not necessarily causal but it certainly goes alongside with as you increase inequalities in access to resources you increase inequalities in health which means that some places are going to be left like the Glasgow effect. Okay. Fabian over, over to you um, we'll, we'll do a round on policy but you're, you're s particularly on the labour market you're s you know we've got record vacancies we're told it's a great thing um, but your snapshot of where we really are right now on the labour market. Yes, um, <coughs> well, I, I'd actually like to say something that applies, certainly applies to the labor market, but, but, yeah. but, m but probably more generally to policy. I think this is a, you know, one of the main conclusions I would draw from this conversation and also echoing what Carol was just saying about inequality being multidimensional. I think policies have been, you know, uh, some of them have been, been very successful. The policy response to, in particular, the labor market policy response to COVID has been, has been quite successful. The furlough scheme, for example, now the job support scheme, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but one thing that policy has been, uh, even before the pandemic, is, is very siloed. Is you know, thinking mm -hmm. about, we have a labor market problem, let's do a labor market policy. We have a mental health problem, let's put money into the NHS. Uh, I, I, I think what we're talking about here suggests that uh, policies, the, the, the you know, optimal design of policy should think about the potentially beneficial impact on mental health, for example, that you know, a policy to support jobs and careers would have. Or conversely, uh, you know, uh, uh, we mentioned uh, uh, mental health uh, being, being underfunded. I mean, a better funding of mental health, better approach to, to uh, mental health care uh, will have 
uh, benefits in terms of labor market outcomes, productivity, et cetera, et cetera, and ultimately national wealth. So I think that's that's the important message that one should not think of policies in a, this kind of siloed fashion. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll come back because I want to push the panel on some really concrete kind of proposals they would have, things they would do. Um, but yeah, just your 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 sna your snapshot of, of, of where where we sit today, November going into Christmas, things are opening up. You know, what what can we expect? I think one of the sad realities is we're going to be living with the virus for a very long time, and therefore the sort of adaptations that we put in place in our work lives and our personal lives are likely to stay. Um, it's interesting for me coming down. Um, from Glasgow a couple of days ago just to see differences in um, some of the public health measures, language, behaviours, you know, mask wearing or not, where people wear masks. And, and, um, and in some degree, we're getting a bit of variation across the UK. Um, in, in terms of the, the poli where policy is going with this and where I worry about where we are just now is there's a sense and a messaging that's coming out that, w you know, we're back, you know, we're we're all vaccinated, we're back, we can just go out and go back to where we were. Um, and I think there's a group of people for whom that's exactly the message they want to hear. And it's a group of people for whom that makes them very, very nervous. And when we start thinking about the impacts on health, mental health, people's ability to work, that messaging is really going to be, um, I think, key in how people experience what we're going to go through in the next you know, mm. six, nine months. And one of the things that makes me quite nervous is the government policy approach round about this, which seems to be, well, that's us, the pandemic's over. What we need to do now is focus on our small P or large P political priorities. Um, and what we need to do is get levelling up done or get Brexit done, or rather than actually let's sit back and go, what, do, what are the potential long-term challenges that we're going to be wrestling with for the next decade, yep. not for the next election cycle? And it was struck earlier by Jadget making exactly that point. You know, policy in the UK, economic policy, works on electoral cycles, not on business cycles or on you know, the multi-decade mm. um, period for which, you know, f for you guys, as you enter the, um, the, the labour market, you know, first decade, two decades, is going to be really key. And if that is a bad labour market to be in, the effects of that will be with you for the rest of your careers. Sorry to be too pessimistic, but well, no, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna end on an optimistic tone, I'm sure, <laughs> because I'm gonna really press you guys now on policy and, f and for really specific ideas. Um, I want to start with Dominique, and, and I want to take my um, the advantage I have as chair to just float an idea. So one of the for your opinion and uh, of what happened during the crisis, one of the things we heard yesterday which you have echoed, um, was uh, a hospital doctor who was saying she, was, she faced uh, the difficulty of she was treating a COVID patient and she knew that that would then have knock-on effects for cancer patients that would have their um, operations cancelled. You talked about th this backlog. So my first question is a bit of policy analysis rather than your policy proposal. COVID struck, and we did this thing of setting up these Nightingale hospitals. Mm. It was also uh, not hugely widely reported, but um, it has been reported, so I don't think I'm giving anything away, that the army was also ready to step in, and, to, and they have many, many doctors. Also, lists were made of retired doctors that we could bring in. And actually, it was taken as a kind of um, a victory for the NHS and for the country that we put this emergency capacity in place but we didn't in fact use it. We kind of surged within the capacity we had and actually no one got turned away. W na can we see already now that that was actually a mistake? Because what we've heard from, from your perspective um, uh, as a practitioner you know, on the grounds of GD uh, GP and from a hospital doctor is that loads of people have been turned away. It just wasn't the COVID patients. Should we have used those Nightingale hospitals? Should we have used the army? Should we have used re uh, retired doctors? Well, that's a really interesting question. So that part of the problem with the Nightingale hospitals is actually there wasn't the staffing mm -hmm. that was required at the level it would have been required. And it also wasn't specialized in any particular way. So you can't just say, well, you know, all the cancer patients who have been 
put off or all the mental health patients can go and see these people because you know army doctors for example may not be specialized mm. in that particular mm. you know area or retired doctors may not want to come back and deal with that that might be part of the reason they retired so um i think but it's covid covid is a unified problem yes. and so yeah. um i was talking to a doctor that was saying actually what we could have done is um, put all of the covid patients in the nightingale hospitals because you needed fewer doctors, because people's symptoms are so similar, mm. you can kind of treat them more en masse and then keep the cancer patients and, and the people with depression and all the other things in the regular system. I'm not sure that's that? true. Mm. You know, COVID evolved constantly. People were learning about it on the job all mm. the time. The ITU specialists are brilliant at it now because they've learned all the way along. Okay. If we had um, put all the COVID patients into these mass hospitals with people who were kind of coming back from having been retired, uh, you know, I just don't think that's the way that you care for people with an unknown new condition that was developing new symptoms all the time. So I think that was probably wishful thinking. Um, we, we just don't have enough staff in the NHS at the best of times, let alone to double our numbers and put them in, in, in the Nightingale hospitals. So... You know, I, I do really worry. Not only have we had the hit on staff, as I said, emotional, physical impact. Lots of people are retiring earlier than they might have been or are leaving over the last, have left over the last 18 months. And we're not, you know, we, although we are now recruiting, we've got more medical students, more nursing students and so on coming in. Many of those roles, which are so vital, so important, are still not valued the way they should be. So my, I guess one of the things I would say is that we need to value the roles. For example, the mental health specialists, psychologists, you know, assistant psychologists are not paid at all. There are lots of things where we just, it's just the way it's always been. It's the level that we pay people at. And we don't value the roles that matter, that help people to get better um, enough. So I'm not talking about doctors, I'm talking about the, all the associated healthcare professionals. Yeah. And I think that is fundamentally something we're going to need to do, value them properly, make them a role and that by people value want to... Uh, well, have money, but, also, yeah. but also make it a sort of, you know, real status thing, you know, yeah. really um, something that people want to do so that you can recruit into those roles. I mean, we can barely recruit enough GPs and psychiatrists who have a decent status in society. <laughs> and we have not enough of those so just imagine if you're wanting to be a community psychiatric nurse or something like that it is a really tough job and it's an amazing job to do but the turnover is pretty quick and then people move out of the NHS after they've done it a few years because it's just too much the way it is at the moment with the caseload same with social workers you know they need a huge status boost and some of that would be financial but also just how we view them in society so that's something I think is really important is how we view and value those roles okay thank you that's a that's a really clear point carol and also to the rest of the panel I, i'm really looking for concrete steps we could take so let's take one off the table which is just to sort of say um more more money and i'm going to say okay you you go and talk to rishi sunak and somehow because you take something off the table somewhere else or you decide we can borrow more you've got more money okay what are the the concrete steps we need to take uh, in our labour market, more generally in our economy, so that we um, s soothe or smooth or ease this tension between how our economy fares with its ups and downs, and then the impact that then has on people's mental health. Um, I mean, I want to make kind of two policy issues, and one is very specifically to, talk to carry on Dom's theme on pay. I think one of the issues in caring professions, particularly caring professions that were dominated by women, which means the lower end historically of those caring professions, have had very little career progression in terms of pay. Gov and governments have spent quite a lot of time trying to increase, for example, the entry pay of primary school teachers and nurses, for example. What they haven't paid any attention to because they're concerned about equity issues in pay and pay being regulated in the public sector, is that career progression is very poor in terms of pay and therefore status. A head nurse who heads a whole ward will be paid very little more than a starting nurse entering that career. So there's no career progression in many public services and particularly in the public services that were dominated by women. 
community health workers, mental health workers, nurses, not the psychiatrists, not the doctors. And that's really something that we need to redress if we are to do what Dominic talks about. It's not pay per se, it's, it's the slope as economists, you'll understand this, it's the slope of the wage profile over the life cycle. And that's what gives job status. You can come in as a dog's body and end up at the top. If you can't, if you're always going to be a dog's body, which is basically what a lot of nurses are in a very stressful job, you're never going to make that job attractive uh, to enough people. The other thing I would like to say as a policy is that throwing money at the NHS when you have no staff is pointless. <laughs> And that's what we have. We have no reserve of staff. We've used them up. Many people who came back after retirement are exiting as fast as their legs will carry themselves. Um, we aren't having enough entry into those professions. So what you do when you've got a shortage in economics and not enough labor supply is you drive up wages. And weirdly, you do. And in the NHS, because you can't drive up wages and you can't solve this wage progression problem because you're not allowed to do so by the unions and the government, what happens is you start spending on stupid things. And we can see that from Gordon Brown. So I would not advocate more money for the NHS at all. The, the NHS has had a huge slug. Until we solve this labor supply problem, we're not going to solve NHS problems. I would advocate putting money into early years. What went into Sure Start was pitiful. We need to really revamp programs for disadvantaged young families because we know that disadvantage early in life has a long legacy. Thank you. R t really, two really, really clear uh, policy answers there. Fabian, what, w what would you do? What would your specific policy solutions be? Well, I, I'd like to sort of take up what Carol was saying and sort of maybe expand it to the wider labor market a little bit. I, uh, I, I think attention should be shifted maybe from focusing on very aggregate numbers such as, you know, there are lots of vacancies around and you know, there aren't as many unemployed workers as, as we thought there would be. And, and focus more on uh, you know, what economists call the mismatch, whether people, it's not so much whether people have jobs or don't have jobs, it's whether the, people's, the people who have jobs have the right jobs and what are their career opportunities. And if you look, for example, at the increase in vacancies that, uh, that uh, you know, has been trumpeted in the press many times uh, recently, it's driven by a few very, very specific occupations. It's driven by things like, uh, you know, truck drivers and uh, uh, waiters and bar staff, for example. Uh, in in, in uh, t taking the example of a nurse for th that Carol just talked about, I mean, the demand for nurses has been, uh, uh, you know, relatively stable even throughout the, the, the pandemic. However, if you look at the demand, the vacancies in occupations that nurses usually transit into when they quit nursing, that's gone down a lot. So if you look at the, you know, the career opportunities of nurses now relative to what they were before the pandemic, they're, they're not as rosy as just counting the number of nurse vacancies would suggest. And I think, th so the, you know, policy should pay attention to that, to, uh, the, to the assignment of workers into jobs and to the distribution of um, uh, of occupations rather than just the aggregate number of vacancies. And if I may say just one thing, uh, another, on a com well, not completely different, but slightly different uh, mm. policy point. Uh, policy throughout the pandemic has been uh, geared to kind of supporting people in work and, you know, preserving jobs and preserving matching capital. The furlough scheme was, ab was, was all about that. And that's great, and that was successful. However, if you look at mental health and the labor market, I mean, clearly one of the worst things that can happen to, to somebody, uh, a worker, a working age person in terms of mental health is to lose their job. Mm. And right now in the UK, we have a system where there's quite a bit of support for people in work, much less so for people who are not in work. And may maybe, maybe kind of shifting resources or, or if you give me more money like you did in, in your introduction, uh, 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 you know, giving more resources to, to support uh, people who are out of work you know, might, might have not only labor market benefits, but also, but also benefits in terms of health. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so final question for the panel, and then I'm gonna turn to the audience. So do, do get ready with your hands, w uh, with your questions. Yeah, a policy, one or two really clear policy solutions. Well, look, I think it's really quick because I think everything that my fellow panelists have said, I think it's absolutely right. Um, and in particular, Carol's point about if I can 
um, summarise it a bit as we need to move away from reacting to everything to actually thinking ahead about what's coming down the line and what the challenges are, intervene earlier um, and work on prevention at an earlier stage rather than simply reacting to what happens when we don't intervene. Um, but uh, just my given that was taken by, by Carol, um, th I guess th th the one other thing I would, I would emphasize is um, a point actually was made in the previous panel. We care about what we measure and we measure what we care about. And at the moment we measure economic outcomes and we track them and the Chancellor will stand up at the uh, dispatch box when he delivers his budget and talk about the economic projections and say absolutely nothing about these wider problems. And if <coughs> we're... Oh. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, um, <coughs> okay. Um, I'll distract. Um, but, you know, if, if we're going to take this seriously, we need to start measuring what's happening to the health and mental health of the population far better than we currently do, um, at a far more granular level, much higher frequency, um, and linking this into economic experience so that we can properly start to understand the links between people's health and mental health and, and their economic experience. Okay, great. Thank you. That's been really interesting, panel. Thank you very much. I know now there's going to be lots of questions from the audience. <coughs> Please raise your hand uh, if you've got a question, and we've got roving mics that will come to you. Um, let me see. I'm looking for some questions. Yes, we have <coughs> here, the lady at the front. Uh, and if uh, if you could, if you'd like to, you don't have to. If you'd like to say your name and where you're from, that might help the rest of the audience. Um, hi, I'm Marina. Uh, I'm from Belarus originally. My question is essentially like we all agreed about the negative impact that COVID and particularly the lack of social interaction it brought had on people's mental health and with all the trends and digitalization that it brought for example like we can even now that we say COVID is kind of over the um, the like active phase of it and we're back into in-person learning but these trends still stayed in education um, in work in work with people more uh, still working from home a lot and looking for um yeah and looking for these opportunities and with like facebook now creating uh, a meta universe where which is essentially like a place where people would have an avatar and they would be able to like work digitally um sitting at home and being like in office somewhere in the cloud. So do all these trends are they're so pronounced and like there's so much money is pumped into it. So are we essentially moving to the world where people will be getting less like social interaction? And does that lead to how how does that affect mental health in like in the future potentially? Great. Thank you. Really, really good question. I'll take a couple so that we can and take them around the audience. So uh, we have got Oliver on this side, a little bit further back. Charlie, there's a lady there. <coughs> Hi, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, you said that one of the issues facing this generation was a general and pronounced fear of failure among adolescents. What do you think are some of the policies to specifically address this, and how would you measure it given that a fear and its implications, I think, would be quite hard to quantify. <laughs> okay, those are two really great questions. So on the first one, I mean, I don't know that much about it, but in case you guys don't know even less about it, this idea of the metaverse is essentially sort of social media, doing everything, working from home, the Zoom world we've all experienced, but just on steroids. You know, we'd, we'd, be <laughs> we'd live in the cloud. Uh, essentially, is, as Marina's point, and, and the, there are these other trends towards digitalization. How much would, should we, we be worried about that? But let me also flip her question, because, and particularly to you, Fabian, um, on the labor market side, are there offsetting benefits of these trends as well? So let's start first with the medical angle. As a, as a doctor, <laughs> uh, you know, spent a long time looking after young people. Are you worried about this idea of a metaverse where nobody's actually going to meet any other human beings? Yeah, I think we, we would be foolish not to be worried. As I said, we are humans who evolved to be with other humans, and that's how we 
you know, bond and move forward through life and so on. So whilst um, I think that there will no doubt be developments, because I'm sure that's what Facebook wants to happen, um, we have to remember that we need to make time in our lives to stay well, to connect with other people, um, the people that matter to us. And I think one of the things that was interesting over the last 18 months is it kind of narrowed down. You really realised who it was you liked to see and spend time with when you were allowed your one hour of exercise outdoors or whatever. Um, so I, I think, you know, we will still need to have a part of our lives that is lived with other people. Do you want me to address the fear of failure thing? Or should I well, let's come back to fear of failure. Uh, on digitization, and, mm. and, and, and I'm going to group you three as economists, <laughs> three economists. Um, yeah, downsides of that. But then also, it, you know, is not LinkedIn an example of digitization of the economy? And doesn't that, in a way, deal directly with one of your points, Fabian, that we need to understand everyone, all of their skills, not just treating them as a nurse, but somebody who has all these different skills. And maybe they could do nursing, maybe they could do another job, maybe they could do another job. And doesn't technology actually help us widen our understanding of people? I, I think that that's completely right. I mean, I, I, technology, technological progress on average is beneficial. Now, of course, it has distributional consequences. It will or it has even consequences that may be adverse in some dimensions while positive in others. Uh, just to step back a little bit, I mean, this, this question kind of reminds me of the age-old question of, uh, you know, uh, aut what's called now called automation, or, you know, was sometimes referred to in the past as the end of work, you know, this fear that, uh, uh, you know, capital was going to take over everything and that we were to going to invent machines that, uh, that, was, that were going to, to put everyone out of work. Uh, now we, we've been through this past couple of years where we had to work on Zoom, we had to do everything remotely, and I mean, perhaps we have this impression that you know the future, that's what the future holds for us now, everything's going to be online. Uh, that may or may not be true. Uh, what I, I do think is that in, in the long run, if it is true, it m means that you know, the benefits will have, uh, will have um, outweighed the costs. Mm. And there will be costs, uh, certainly mental health costs, uh, but you know, there are also, uh, there are also uh, you know, policies that can be put in place, I think, to, to, to counter those costs. Joe, do you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess part of it is there are huge benefits to the technological innovation we've seen over the last year. 18 months. Let's, you know, acknowledge that. Um, and so for some people, the pandemic has been fantastic in the sense that, you know, their work life actually now fits much better with their own personal life. Um, perhaps they actually weren't that comfortable working in a big open plan office and much happier working at home. So for some people, the change in their work life that's happened through the pandemic has been for the better. But I think the danger lies in saying, well, we've got this technology now, this is a new way of working, and everyone now has to fit into this. Because the flip side of that will be there will be people for whom this is absolutely the antithesis of how they want to work. Um, and we have struck by really early on in the pandemic, um, research coming out saying, working at home boosts productivity. Well, e okay, but that was based on people who pre-pandemic chose to work from home. That doesn't necessarily apply to everyone else. Yeah. Um, yeah. And indeed, through the pandemic, I, I'm not sure people were any more productive. I think people just worked a lot longer um, and did many more hours, but mm. maybe I'm cynical. Carol, fear of failure. So y in the labor market, uh, in all aspects of economics and all aspects of life, you have to put yourself up for things. You have to go for things. You have to apply for jobs. Um, if you're if you fear failure, this is going to be something that's that's going to limit you. But how can we de-risk? How can we make it easier for young people to, to not fear failure, economically speaking? I don't think I'm a very good person to actually talk about that because I actually think this is a worldwide trend that in Singapore, in Japan, these things have been going on much longer, actually, because their education system is so competitive and the returns to going to a good university are so high compared to the returns to going to a local uh, I think that's fine. I think the audience will accept a, glo a global solution so, if so you've got one. So I'm not sure I have a global... Uh, no, no, what I'm saying is I'm not sure I have a global solution to this. I think it's part of what you see, big trends happening in automation, in technology, 
what we probably need as a solution is kind of thinking about mediating solutions to mean that there are other things for people to do who don't succeed. It can't be winner takes all. It, it's got to be that there are other policies directed at those people that don't make the top 99.1% of their class or don't make the top 99% of you know all intakes into mm. a law firm. But those are very general policies, Richard. Um, I'm going to I'm going to come back to the the audience for more questions now. Um, we've got one here at the front. Let's start at the front and, and work back. Hey. Hello. Uh, Hi. I am Marta uh, from the University of Warwick, and I wanted to direct the panel towards the climate change because, for me and for many of my peers, it. Uh, it feels difficult um, to achieve something, of course, because of competitiveness, but also there is this aspect of hopelessness that there is so much uh, coverage about climate change and, well, how our time is doomed and it doesn't matter what I will achieve career-wise if the earth is doomed in 20 years or something like that. Okay. So, yeah, that's... Really interesting, important question. Let's, let, I'll, let's take a few, because we've got 20 minutes and we've got about 15 questions. So, here at the front, there's a gentleman, then there, and then there's two in the next row. So, let's take those four together. Hey, um, I'm Ewan. Um, I'm an economist at the ONS. Um, and a question kind of about sort of a fairly new policy um, for both mental and kind of physical health, but about social prescribing. And I know that in Glasgow particularly, this is something which has been used for men generally um, in their sort of 40s, 50s, 60s kind of thing, trying to get them things like playing football and stuff like that and just sort of seeing what other types of social prescribing you, you see as... So social prescribing means you prescribe something other than a drug, you prescribe something like right. joining a club or doing an activity, is that what it is? Yeah, and yeah, it okay. can be a real kind of like yeah. variety of things. Yeah. To do yeah. That. So yeah, just interesting. Great question, thank you. There's two on the next row, please, Ben. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm Sid, I'm from the University of Bristol. I do economics and politics in my final year. Um, I had a question more on the policy side of things. So of course, post pandemic and throughout the pandemic as well, the gig, the gig economy, so gig workers have sort of spiked quite high. Um, so in terms of policy, would you recommend that their health is being taken care of by the government or employers separately? Um, or what do you reckon would be the solution to this? Because it's gonna be, like Stuart said, going on for the next decade or so um, in terms of health for them because the gig workers are often the ones who are out there yeah um, yeah great great question Sid. so you know these these um, Silicon Valley firms they've changed the way they we work they lots of them make huge profits should they be funding the the downside if there is one of mental health along hi there um, Tom Aldred from uh, the Treasury um, I was very struck by, I think it's a really interesting session, um, I was very struck by what Carol said about the different impacts of the pandemic on people. Um, and one of my uh, one potential worries is that those people who are making policy, both the politicians uh, and the officials, might be more drawn to the people who've had a good pandemic and find it difficult to sort of naturally see uh, that it ha has been very negative for a lot of people suggestions on how we might uh, overcome that. Really interesting. I'm going to do one more row, actually, and then ask the panel to pick, because we've got so many. Um, uh, yes, here. Thanks. Hello. <coughs> Excuse me. Hello, I'm Sahaj from uh, Warwick. So uh, one of the most underrepresented communities that has been left even more vulnerable after the pandemic is the disabled community, right? And um, one of the biggest sort of problems we face is that of inaccessibility, both, say, infrastructural and social. So um, I, I, what I, would, I would want to ask the panel of what they think with respect to the world becoming more inclusive of disabled people in the future. Thank you. And actually, would you keep going, Ben, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get <laughs> at this long list. Uh, otherwise, we're not going get, to get through them. Because I hope that you m when you go through them, you might be able to tackle a couple. Yeah, so at the back, um, two gentlemen at the back. And then we'll have our last ones here. Hi, um, I'm Sam from HSE. Uh, I sensed a little bit of um, potential disagreement on the panel. So I heard from Carol. Never. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> I heard from Carol that, that maybe extra funds for NHS mental services perhaps isn't going to make too much of a difference, but I heard from a lot of other people that there's been critical underfunding of those services. So I'd, I'd be interested in someone making a bit of a counter-argument to Carol. <laughs> okay. Oh, she can make her own counter-argument. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will. And I'll clarify. Uh, two down, um, please. And then Charlie, do you mind running a mic down here to these these two women at the front, and then we'll <laughs> and then we'll <laughs> do some rapid answers. <laughs> Great questions, everyone. Thank you. Yes, there was another one at the back. Uh, my name's Kieran. I'm from the Health and Safety Executive as well. Um, I think Sid asked my question uh, similar, but I'll ask uh, I'll ask it as well. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis in the management of health and safety um, in the regulation around the manager to design the work and the relationship that the manager has with the with the worker. And that's being sort of broken up a little bit with people working from home increasingly and also, uh, like Sid said, new forms of work around gig working, for example, which I think necessarily will put more of the emphasis and the responsibility on the worker themselves to identify where an issue is and, and try to control it. That may not be the best outcome, but it, it seems to be one that might come about. So I wondered what the panel thought about the um, ability and the education of workers to, to be prepared for that as they go into the workplace and then to deal with those problems as they come up. Great, thank you. And then our, our final two are at the front here. And don't worry, I've made a note of them. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lean, and I'm from the University of Bristol. Um, so I would like to ask this question about um, a phenomenon that we've seen in the early days of the pandemic, particularly in the early months, when there were a lot of, um, when, for example, we saw this um, change in the public perception of the NHS and of other key workers. People started clapping for the NHS every Thursday, for example, and they've been considered heroes in many ways. However, we saw that in later months, um, despite a lot of conversations around this, there, have been, there has been little increase in pay, and many key workers, and not just NHS workers, but many key workers were disappointed to find that their working conditions still have not improved. So my question is, to what extent can public perception of NHS workers, but also key workers more generally, affect the government policy towards um, in increasing their pay, for example, or benefits, or anything that can actually substantially um, show how necessary and essential they are and reflect that? Great, thank you. And if you'd pass the mic over. <laughs> Thanks. Hey. I'm Robin. Um, I'm from the e University of Bristol. I'm an economics and management student. So I was wondering with the um, digitalization and technology, the way we're moving towards that, um, that we're becoming more accessible in time. So where you're in the office nine till five, now we're accessible through any time of the day and the impact that that might have on mental health and the labor market. Thank you, brilliant. So let's, um, we've got about 15 minutes. I've got a lot of questions <laughs> to answer. Um, let's start with this. There's a bit of a theme there on the gig economy. So we've got Deliveroo, Uber, we've got these people that are breaking down the economy, the way it works. Um, and breaking down when we can work, we might be expected to work through the night. Does what what steps need to be taken on that? And then that answers that specific question: Should should these companies pay some sort of extra levy because of the toll they might be having? So over to you, panel. Who wants to tackle that? Can Carol, I, can I can yeah. I say set this a little more generally? I think historically, employers in the past in some sectors have been more. Um, used to paying for health care for their workers, particularly, say, before the NHS mm -hmm. and in countries that don't have the things like the NHS. And I think one of the things we need to do is shift back responsibility for health and well-being onto employers generally, partly and particularly in the space of mental health. Employers are very reluctant to employ people with mental health problems. They're reluctant enough, and this speaks to the disability point, uh, to employ people with chronic physical health problems. But mental health tends to be an absolute no-no for employers. We need to redress that balance by saying to employers, you are responsible for the physical, you, you, or you have ris some responsibility for the physical and mental health of your well-being of your employees. And that's indeed what we recommended in the Macron Commission in France. That, that there should be more, at and there are some very good policies out there. Take the example of Denmark um, and, some, and a couple of other countries, some German policies as well, which really talk about the uh, importance of workplace-based 
health policies. Mm. Yeah, that's a really clear answer. I know there are a few pe people in the audience that have essays to write coming up. <laughs> if that is you, you might want to take a look at something called the paternalist movement here in the UK. So my grandparents, for example, uh, in working class in Lancashire, met in the playground of a school that was built by the company and the local GP was funded by their company because their parents worked in the mill. You know, so they, their parents had a dangerous job and the offset from that was they got their school and their house uh, and so on. That's a very different system to the one we have now. Let's turn to a completely different thing, which is social prescribing. Uh, is that something Is that something that's been um, tried in, in Glasgow? But I is it something that um, uh, could potentially be a help us and help us now? So clubs... Oh, Let's start here, yeah, but also sorry, I, I think it may have been tried in Glasgow. But yeah, th th there have been a few examples of this um, across the country. Men's sheds and various things. Um, and and I, I'm really interested to hear your view on this. Hmm. Um, I mean, I, I, I think the pandemic certainly did, for some people, friends and, and so on, felt a sense of isolation. It wasn't sort of the, the quiet solitude that you can get things done, but it was isolation. And hmm. I think increasingly... That did particularly with this digital divide, older friends and you know, my parents and things, and their social network shrinking and um, actually getting put in contact with people. And I mean, co as well, just for, for this audience as well. Uh, and, and then, sorry, I'll, I'll um, <laughs> yield back. But I just, it, it must be so weird being going to university in the middle of a pandemic, mm. um, and you're in tutorials with people you've not actually met. Um, you don't you don't establish a social network in the same way. And really, particularly in the first couple of years, that social network's what gets you, got me through university. Um, and it just it must, you know, when we talk about enduring impacts, that absence of a social network, you know, m maybe actually this is a, um, a solution more broadly. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's very much an important point is the fact that uh, young people who are in education at the moment haven't had a normal year for three years. So, you know, it's quite impactful when you realise if you are in year 11 now about to do your GCSEs, you, your last normal school year was year eight. You know, it is really impactful when we think about that. But social prescribing um, has been around for a little while. It started with books and library prescribing and things like that. And then it widened out to, you know, activities like gardening. And it's used from all sorts of different ways to get people to get back outside or active or connect with others. There are lots of ways it's used. And it is a, a really useful thing. But um, a lot of it is just about, you know, doing normal everyday human stuff but with other people in a sort of way that's organized for you so you don't have that stress as well it's been particularly useful in mental health so people who have been isolated this is pre-pandemic as well um have been able to go on walking groups that are led by somebody who's able to you know make sure the conversation is facilitated appropriately and so on so it, it is a really good initiative and just as an aside on the isolation thing um if you haven't seen it there's a brilliant free resource called what's up with everyone.com created by Ardman Animation on young people's sort of mental health and well-being and it was launched this year and it's got five big sections in it um, and it covers competitiveness, perfectionism, isolation, social media and independence as sort of five big topics for young people who might be interested and the one that's been looked at, well the two that have been looked at the most and in the first six months since, or more since February is isolation and perfectionism and I think that says an awful lot about what it's like to be a late teen, early 20s person right now. Mm, that's really interesting. And so what was that? What that's was called whatsupwitheveryone.com. Whatsupwitheveryone.com. It's a free okay. new Ardman, uh, lots of animations. Brilliant. Great, thank you. Let's turn uh, briefly, if you would, Carol. Um, will you have an argument with yourself, please, uh, for yeah, no yes. more than a, a couple of minutes on the sort of fiscal side? More money, not more money, is money I wasted? I, I think what I said is I don't think we need more money for the NHS per se at the moment. What we need is, but what I want to clarify is what I meant is we need a redressing of that money. Ah. That money needs to be spent, for example, on wages for nurses and the career progression I talked about, but also, I think, on mental health services away from physical health services and on preventative health services away from acute services now. Nobody's going to like that in terms of the 
acute providers are the dominant group in any healthcare system. This is this is a big picture thing that's been going on in all healthcare systems in developed countries and indeed in developing countries. But that I think we've got a pot of money. It's a generous settlement to the NHS and there are many other calls on that money. Within that, there should be actively redressing towards community care, towards community care providers, and that includes mental health. Mm -hmm. So that's my, it's not really an argument myself, <laughs> it's a clarification of perhaps a sloppy bit of wording. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, the pictures that, uh, it's going to be sort of data question, I guess, here, um, I shall ask the two economists at the end. The pictures that the public sector and particularly politicians get, um, the idea from, from Tom in the audience was maybe they're biased, maybe they're there's particular people that actually have done quite well through COVID and they may be their friends, they may be their social groups, they may be, may be their employees. Um, how can we make sure using better data, maybe qualitative data, I guess, could be an answer, more sort of interviews with people, but how we can, make, can we make sure that the, the people making the policies really get an accurate picture of what things, what things are like for people? Yeah, um, I mean, I, <laughs> that's a difficult question. I, I'm, I'm actually not sure I agree with the premise. In the, in this, I mean, I do agree with the premise that the people <laughs> actually making policy decisions uh, have been through the pandemic in very specific conditions. But uh, I, I do think a lot of the policy is evidence-based. And, uh, uh, you know, we're all biased by our own experience. So here, for example, we've been talking a lot about, uh, you know, the problems with working from home. But if you look at, you know, the fraction of the labor force that's actually working from home now, it, it's relatively small. It's bigger than it was before the pandemic, but it's relatively small. I mean, most people actually go to work, cannot work from home because by the nature of their jobs. Uh, and so uh, this is stuff that you see in the data. And I think this is, this is you know, why we need economists, why we need statisticians. And this is, uh, this is things that I, I, I hope, I think, uh, um, you know, uh, government departments are are, uh, are are well equipped to to look at data, and, and that's what you know. So I'm I'm not sure if it's really, you know, the particular perspective of this or that minister that you know matters. Mm. In the well, and let let me um, uh, sort of take one one of the questions, and because it's in a way there's a way of answering in the same way, which is how can we make sure that policy policy is it in tune with and listens to the voices of different people and in particular the disabled community so is enough done um, in the labor markets in labor market policies to ensure that people with disability are able to access the labor market are able to access job work and pay that's, that's economists <laughs> I mean I, I'd jump in on the broader thing and then come to that yeah um, I don't think it's a unique thing for Treasury um, worrying about whether or not they're bringing a set of values and experiences to the table in making decisions. Um, I think it's a, an issue more generally in organisations that the people who get to the top in organisations, the people that set agendas in organisations, aren't necessarily reflective of um, you know, society as a whole. Um, and of course, in some ways, we kind of think, well, we elect politicians and politicians will reflect our views back in geographically and ethnically and, um, and, and everything else. Um, I, I think the Bank of England have done probably the most of any public organisation in terms of trying to get input both diverse across society but also regionally into their, um, their thinking, the decision-making process, trying to understand what's happening in different parts of the country, how different groups are being affected. Um, but there's always going to be something of a bias towards things you can measure or things you choose to measure. Because there's lots of things you can measure that you just choose not to. Um, and on the, the point about um, people with disabilities and long-term health conditions who are likely to experience some of the worst and most enduring impacts of the pandemic, we don't know very much. We don't measure very well what their labour market experience is like. You know, we have a, um, a very persistent gap between the employment experience of disabled people and people with long-term health conditions and the rest of society. Um, but we sort of recognise that and go, oh, there's a gap. 
Um, whereas when it comes to things like the gender pay gap, when it comes to um, gender participation, we've seen all sorts of policies come forward in the last um, five, six, seven years. So companies with more than 250 employees now have to report their gender pay gap. Um, you know, we've put such a light on that, but not on, so we're forcing companies now to measure and report that, but we're not paralleling that for people with disabilities and long-term health conditions. Um, so I, I think there is, just to go back to the same thing of, it's not just what we measure, it's what we choose not to measure. I think it's really interesting. Yeah, so clarifying, I think companies are going to have to make a ma play a massive role to your question, and clarifying exactly what they're doing is going to be really Im important. I mean, you should never base things on personal experience, but just from two disabled people, one I know very well and one who's in my family, um, one company that we'd all expect that does, does this stuff really well is, is Waitrose, part of John Lewis. Everybody loves John Lewis. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's owned, it's owned by its staff, and so that's why people love it, and you'd expect them to do that. The other one is actually Amazon, you know, which people love to, uh, to pile in on. I'm not here to defend Amazon, but I know they have very forward-thinking policies in some of these areas. So we're mm. going to need firms to do a lot, and, and all firms, basically, I guess is, is the core of your answer. Um, the final question, and I've got a really quick answer to this one here that I haven't forgotten, but the final question for the panel is how do we turn this clapping on Thursdays? Uh, and again, you've, got, you've really got 30 seconds on this and not all of you need to answer. We, I need one good answer. How can we turn this Thursday clapping, which started and then it ended, into genuine change of how we think about our healthcare system um, and I think about ourselves, our role in that healthcare system and how it protects us? I think I should go to the medic. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, I mean, it was lovely seeing the people who are working hard, the key workers, the NHS workers being appreciated like that, but it's also been really painful to hear the criticism of GPs over the last few months, which has literally led to assaults on GPs, on their receptionists and everything. We've got to look at our media. I think our media plays an enormous part in all of this, and maybe we need to push back on that. I don't have a quick answer how we <laughs> fix that. It's, it's a problem. But, you know, stirring up one emotion and then stirring up another is a really unhelpful thing when it turns into an enormously negative wave towards a group who have basically just worked solidly throughout. Um, you know, they were doing things that no one ever saw, like when the pandemic was coming, before we even realised but could see it was coming, my husband and I were up at B&Q buying plastic gloves, plastic PPE, anything we could find, because there was none provided by the NHS, just so that his receptionist would be protected from day one of all of this sort of thing changing. Um, and it's those same people who then get criticised and shouted at in reception and the rest of it now. So whatever we do, we have to look at how we reflect you know, people's emotions and feelings about these things and how the media does that and maybe challenge that more. I don't, I don't have another quick answer. Thank you. Okay, final um, three points for me. First one is lunch. Lunch will be served immediately <laughs> after this uh, in the back. Uh, the second one is what's coming up next. We've got Lizzie Burden, um, superstar reporter at Bloomberg and a great panel talking about something completely different. The global picture should be fantastic. Stay around for that. And then finally, on climate change, I promised you I'd, I would answer your question. On your way to lunch, you can pick up a copy of Eco Magazine, which is being held up at the, at the back. Our latest magazine is all about climate change. To answer your question, it's probably worse than you imagine. Take a look, take a look at the charts. It's really worrying. However, there's real reason to hope. The price of renewables is falling rapidly. But third point, policy point, and you guys all need to get on it. I didn't used to um, think much about climate change, so I did that magazine. We definitely are going to need a climate tax, a uh, carbon tax. The price of carbon needs to be higher, and it's going to be for your generation to demand that. Finally, just to, it falls to me to thank. That was a wonderful discussion. I really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it too.